Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Today we've got a special episode of Free Thoughts recorded before an audience at the 2015 International Students for Liberty Conference in Washington, D.C. Joining us is Jonathan Blanks, a research associate in Cato's project on criminal justice. So, John, it seems like every day we read stories about police brutality, police misconduct, cops beating up grandfathers out for a walk just, what was it, last week, uh, cops shooting or maiming children, cops killing family pets at an extraordinary rate, blasting away with firearms at even the most minimal hint of a physical threat. So I guess let me start by asking the obvious question, what the hell is wrong with police? (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think there, it's a number of factors. Uh, first of all, I don't think that uh, police officers are being uh, trained properly. I, I think the, as you said, the reaction to any, like the hint of violence, the, they escalate so fast anymore. Uh, it's, it's becoming very problematic. And as in the age of cell phones, we're just seeing a lot more often. Um, other problems uh, are, include lack of accountability. A lot of times they're going to face their own uh, police officers when they're looking for uh, when they're going to be investigated so any misconduct you know you just go to your boss instead of you know if if I hurt you you can go to the police and they will investigate me but if you are the police who are they who do they go to well they just go to their boss and their boss doesn't want any trouble so they'll look the other way do we think that it might be possible that cops themselves have changed are there different types of people who are now cops than maybe were before uh certainly uh there's, there are different theories about why exactly this is going on, but I think part of it is uh, you have federal, the federal government has uh, subsidized hiring uh, m- former military officers coming back from the wars to go because they already have the firearms training. It's just easier, and, you know, it's, it's a jobs program, essentially. And that's, while that's a noble intent, that isn't necessarily – it doesn't transfer immediately. There's, you know – it's an old f- phrase, I think, from Rush Limbaugh. But it was, you know, the military is to kill people and break things. You know, police are to protect and serve. And those are completely different functions. Just because they both carry firearms doesn't mean they're the same thing. Um, and, of course, you see the police militarization, which is one of the – a big thing where it's become a very uh, hostile environment for most police officers. One of the arguments that we hear in favor of militarization or in defense of cops who shoot people out on the street is that it's simply really dangerous to be a cop, especially a beat cop in a city. Is that true? And if it is dangerous, is it more dangerous than it used to be? Uh, yes, it's dangerous to be a police officer. It is not more, it is not more dangerous than it used to be. The police... Uh, in the line of duty, deaths is down. I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but it is at like 20-year lows. Last year was extremely low. Uh, most police-related deaths now in, in duty uh, come from uh, uh, vehicle accidents. You know, you're pulling someone over on the highway, car speeds by, hits you. That's terrible, but it's not that every encounter that you're going to have is going to, be, to result in violence. But I think there is this apprehension because police do – do uh, do bring this up a lot. And when you have the tragedy that happened in New York where some crazy guy kills two cops, you know, that p- police come together. They're a very tight unit. And they, they I don't know, they just sort of uh, circle the wagons. And so they, they kind of promote this... Uh, Blue wall of silence? Well, no, well, no, no that, that's something different. But it, it, it's the... Solidarity? Yeah, the solidarity and the... Just, you know, we protect our own. We're de- we, no one knows what we do. This is what we're going to be like. I, I, teachers. <laughs> teachers say that too, actually. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I think this does sort of go back into the military mentality. It, it's not just because that we're getting veterans, but uh, there's a book by a man named Maurice Punch, and he talks about the sort of similar uh, social mechanisms that work within police departments that, are, that also are reflected in military departments, where mil- military units, where it's – um, it's a band of brothers. Uh, everything, all discipline is handled in house, and uh, sort of like the code red from you know a few good men. And so they are hostile to the outside world. They don't believe that anyone understands what's going on, 
and they are very protective of one another. When you say that police deaths are down substantially over the last 20 years, couldn't someone turn around and say, well, yeah, but that's because we have begun shooting people at the drop of a hat and have begun, you know, arming our cops with military gear and putting them in tanks. So, of course, deaths are down. But if we instituted the reforms that you, you know, bleeding hearts would like us to, then those numbers are going to shoot right back up again. Well, actually, I mean, it's a, that's definitely a correlation causation problem where uh, police officers, uh, with the, particularly with the militarization, like the rise of SWAT, actually make situations much more dangerous. I mean, people protect uh, themselves it, within their own homes with, with firearms. If you throw in a flashbang grenade at 2 o'clock in the morning and you're waking someone up, they don't know if you're cops. I mean, you can say knock and announce, but you're yelling out someone's d- outside of someone's door at 3 a.m. They don't know who you are, and they just hear rumbling in the house. If you, ha- if you live in a bad neighborhood or if you've been robbed recently, which happened in Virginia a few years ago, you come in, you're... You're not gonna. You're gonna f- shoot first, and if you kill a cop, they're gonna try you for capital murder, even though you don't know that you're going after a cop. You don't know anything that's going on, and so this this idea that, well, you know, all the armor and the Kevlar and and the tanks are gonna make police more safe is ab- actually the opposite. Do we have any good numbers now? Anyone here's Facebook feed is like mine. It, it seems like cops are just doing horrible things all the time. Uh, but that's a bias, of course. But do we have any good numbers about how prevalent and comparatively high or low these kind of shootings and violent actions are done by police? No. Why not? Um, Is isn't someone in charge of that? You would think so. But uh, the Bureau of Justice Statistics and the FBI collect data from police departments on uh, violent, uh, violent actions, use of force. Unfortunately, it's a voluntary submission. And so if your department killed five, six, ten people in the past year, and you don't necessarily want the FBI to know it, you don't have to tell them. There's no enforcement mechanism to let you know. Um, so there's a really – so we don't really know how many people are dying. We don't know how many people are being hurt because of the myriad problems of actually reporting police violence and getting someone to respond to it. Would you be in favor of like a federal program that tried to do oversight on that? Um, I've been thinking about that a lot recently. I'm always skeptical of government of large federal government programs, but I think as a check to sort of make the police department's uh, report use of force incidents, yes. Uh, some some people have uh, suggested that uh, you could make. You can make this dependent on the, the myriad subsidies that police officers, that police departments get from the federal government. We've talked about a handful of different kinds of police violence, right? So there's there's the instances of throwing the flashbang into the toddler's bedroom. There's the you know opening up on someone in the street because it looks like they may have been reaching for something. Uh, there's, I mean, are there different kinds of police violence? that we can talk about and are certain ones more prevalent, less prevalent? Yeah, I, I think that basically comes down to five different five different types of violence. First, you have sort of like the random daily harassment um, that you see in like stop and frisk where you're just going to throw someone up against the wall and, and search their pockets. That's common in larger metropolitan areas, but, not, but less so in, uh, say, rural or small towns. Um, then you have what people would consider just police brutality. That's sort of your Rodney King... Uh, just police waylaying on people uh, well beyond what is needed to incapacitate an individual. Um, then you have deadly use of force, which is firearm. Uh, that would, uh, the, you know, the biggest case recently, of course, is um, Mike Brown uh, out in Ferguson. Uh, then you have, a, like, violence as part of, uh, like, a crime that a policeman is committing. Say, if a policeman has become completely corrupted and uh, starts dealing drugs. Then you have coercion, you've got, you know, gangbanging, you've got murder. Um, that's one of the rare, I think, the, probably the rarest of all the, fo- the forms. And, of course, the fifth is police militarization, where you're going to have the flashbangs and using SWAT teams to take down completely peaceful, uh, peaceful operations. Like, uh, recently there was a poker game out in Fairfax County. Uh, I think it was a $20,000 buy-in. And twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, it's twenty thousand oh, dollars. That's a serious buy-in. poker game. It yeah. is a serious <laughs> poker game, 
but the uh the the police came in because they the house took one and a half percent for the rake and basically that paid for uh food beverages and uh a masseuse to like while you're playing because these games would go all day long <laughs> the, 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 fu- the funny thing is though is when the uh when the ho- when the homeowner asked them you know why did you do this and they're like well there are a bunch of asian gangs going around knocking over knocking over poker games and then, and so it, it was quoted in the Washington Post, but he didn't say this directly back to the police officer. He's like, "But you got us first, because they the, they decided they were going to drop the the charges, the criminal charges after six months if they all if all the players keep their nose clean, uh, but they'll keep forty percent of the take uh, due to civil asset forfeiture." So another gang that wasn't an Asian gang raided them and took some of their money, Absolutely. otherwise known as the police department. Yes. Do we think that in terms of the police that are doing these things? Have there been any studies about it's, is it everyone or just bad apples? Is, are they concentrated on specific cops? I, I hate the term bad apples, but there is some evidence to suggest that, particularly with the type of violence that would be uh, sort of the day to day brutality, um, where they're just resisting using, arrest. Yeah, yeah, resisting arrest. That that that's one of the big stats. Where uh, in New York City, five uh, percent of the police force is. Res- is responsible for 40% of the resisting arrest uh, complaints. Resisting arrest is something that criminologists use to measure police brutality. So if they're going to come, if basically if a cop roughs you up during an arrest, basically you could have talked back, you could have done any number of things, you, you ticked off the cop, and he roughs you up, oh, you were resisting arrest, that's why he used force against you. And so 5% of the police officers in the, in, uh, the NYPD are responsible for 40% of those. And if you expand that out, Fifteen percent of uh, NYPD officers are re- are responsible for half. Most of the police officers are not doing that, but because New York Police Department is so stat happy with comp stat and they like track everything and they put it into a computer and they know all the numbers, NYPD knows this is going on and they tolerate it. And that's sort of this lack of accountability that uh, that is. It plagues police departments all over the country. Why do they tolerate it? I mean, if most of this problem comes from a minority of cops and presumably a large chunk of cops became got into the police force because they care about law and order and justice, why are they putting up with this sort of stuff? I mean, wouldn't it be easy enough to just kind of get rid of that 15 or 20 percent? Um, well, there's a bunch of reasons for this. Uh, I think it you can see it in various levels. Uh, First off is what I said earlier with the sort of uh, military mentality where they're going to protect each other. And so your uh, police officers are not going to want to tell on each other because of the blue wall of silence, as Trevor mentioned a little bit, where uh, there is a very strong uh, chance of retaliation if you tell on another cop. It doesn't matter if it's did he take a little money off of a drug bust or did he beat someone and put him in a hospital. Police tep- typically do not uh, talk about other cops because of the both professional and personal ramifications involved. If the, I've read stories where uh, one police officer who's running for sheriff turned in another police officer for a DUI that wasn't reported, and uh, that the reporting police officer that was running for sheriff was run out of the department. It's uh, it gets much worse in in New York City. Again, it, it's I, I hate to keep going back to New York, but it. They have this. They have one of. The, they have the largest police force in the country, and they also have a lot of journalists who look into their police department that gets hit a lot. So we have a lot of stories that come out of there. But there was a famous story uh, back in 2010. Uh, a police officer named uh, Adrian Schoolcraft uh, took a bunch of secret tape recordings inside the police locker rooms and revealed to the press that they were inflating statistics, messing around with comp stat numbers to make it all look good. In retaliation, they had him uh, committed to uh, a psych ward for five days involuntarily. They dragged him out of his house and they said, "Oh, he was he was you know he was uh, he was unstable. We did it for his own good." Well, he ha- when they when they uh, broke down his door and took him out, he also had a tape recording going, and it was completely an- another lie. Um, they harassed him at his house and uh, they ran him out of the department. He still has a $50 million lawsuit against the city and the department for false imprisonment and, and, and whatnot. But, I mean, this wasn't any, like, massive crime. This was just 
well, you know, they're massaging the numbers for PR and, you know, they had him involuntarily committed. This is the sort of retaliation that you're going to face. Now, what about unions, though? Because I think it's funny that I was watching, not really on my own will, Fox News during the Eric Garner and Michael Brown stuff and the amount of way that the conservatives talk about police and say you have to – they're public servants. You have to respect what they do uh, is very similar to how Democrats talk about teachers. It's like, oh, they're public servants. You have to respect what they do. And in both those situations, they're unionized public servants who protect especially the worst ones. So how much do the unions factor into this? Oh, they play a huge role. Um, they – when we had the um, Darren Wilson, My- Michael Brown thing in Ferguson, you had these you know, GoFundMe pages that were there to help support Darren Wilson. They didn't ever say who was collecting the money, but – People track down like the information from the from the pages, and of course, it both was the unions. The unions were responsible, almost certainly, for the um, for the negative PR about for, about Mike Brown releasing the tape of him shoplifting, as if for some reason that you know justified the death penalty, and various other um, you know you know anti PR that are going on. They also have a lot of political strength where they pass uh, law, enf- law enforcement officers' bill of rights that give police all these special privileges when they're accused of misconduct that no, that no civilian would ever get. Uh, this, sometimes these get passed into legislation. Sometimes they just become standard operating procedure. Uh, Darren Wilson, when he uh, was interviewed uh, by the grand jury, he said, yeah, I know I gave that statement at first, but I'm not quoting but I gave that statement, but I was told that what you're supposed to do is have uh, 72 hours before you really make a statement on what happened after a, a use of force incident. And, you know, I had a couple days to sleep on it, and I th- remember it much better. I don't know of a single homicide detective in the country that would <laughs> say, you know, I know you just shot somebody, but um, here you go. Take like three days. Here's the number of a good lawyer and come back. But that's the sort of thing that law enforcement bills of rights do. I don't know whether or not it's um, legislative, legislatively supported in Missouri, but that sort of thing, cooling off periods, um, always having counsel with you, um, not being able to uh, say that of any implication about your job when you're being interviewed about mm. uh, some misconduct that you may have committed, all of these things are part of union-sponsored bill of rights. Well, they so also they try come, to nationalize that. They actually. come back also with – a recitation of the event that has all these key words in it that the Supreme Court has been like, and they, they just put them in there, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, um, I mean, I don't know, I, I don't know enough about the inner workings to pin it on the unions, but when you have, uh, you have two Supreme Court cases, uh, Tennessee v. Garner and uh, Graham v. Connor, that basically lay out what a police sh- policeman should do in a use of force situation. Um, basically, to use deadly force, you have to be in imminent fear of your life. You have to, or you have to fear for the public, or uh, you they because Tennessee v. Garner came from a case where a guy had just like robbed a house. He was a skinny guy running away, wasn't armed, nothing, and they shot him dead. And the Supreme Court said, "No, you can't do that." Uh, he wasn't any. He wasn't uh, a public health threat. Excuse me, a public safety threat, and he post no threat to you so you can't shoot him so when you ever hear of a police officer shooting someone you'll hear something along the lines of oh he reached for his waistband could be a gun he was charging right for us like it was south park you know ah, it's coming right for us <laughs> um the you know oh he didn't respond to less lethal force like tasers or beanbag rounds or whatever there was just a, a shooting the other day um out in Arizona, I think, so one of the western states, a guy was just throwing rocks at cars, uh, like at an overpass, uh, at a bunch of cars. And it, I mean, it's dangerous. I mean, you hit a car. I mean, these are b- big rocks. You hit a car, they could swerve into a lane. It could kill someone. So it's not that the police shouldn't have involved. They said that, uh, you know, they, t- they tased him, he didn't respond, and then they responded with lethal force. Well, then the videotape came out. And sure enough, he was running away when they shot him. And this is why I think body cameras and dash cameras and pe- people recording police interactions are so important. But the 
this sort of there's just a boilerplate of what police say. Oh yes, yes. I was imminently afraid of my life, and I feared for the public safety. It's like they're reciting. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's just like it's, like how it's no like, one actually talks. Right? Yeah, yeah. So the Supreme Court, you know, basically gives you a blueprint of what to say, and this happens pretty much every fatal use of force situation. So. If- Cops go around protecting cops, whether through the unions or this wall of silence or whatever. But there's also I mean, there are people out there whose job it is in part to protect us from the bad cops. Right. So the the district attorneys who are supposed to prosecute these cops do you, you hear these stats about how few cops get indicted by grand juries compared to civilians who committed similar crimes are DAs – do DAs protect cops? And if so, why would they be doing that? I, I think – well, I mean it, all this boils down to is incentives. District attorneys work with police officers to make their cases. If a police officer is accused of misconduct, whether it's violence, whether it's you know perjury, wh- whatever it is – Wait, cops lie? Sometimes. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes. Ooh. The, the – uh, the district attorney, the prosecutors are disincentivized from exposing that or to – I mean they can't intentionally hide it. That, that, that's against the rules. They get disbarred. However, they are incentivized not to look or ask too many questions because if you find an unreliable police officer, all your cases that you prosecuted from – on the word of that police officer get questioned. You have to reopen it up. And so a bunch of guilty people go free and obviously you don't want that. Uh, other people that are supposed to protect us from police officers are civilian, civilian review boards that are supposed to look over misconduct within police departments. Uh, they f- face pressure from the unions. They face pressure from uh, budgetary restraints. People who say, you know, we don't really need this, you know, because police officers are so well trusted. They are, I think, the second highest like profession trusted in the in the country. Um, like this, you're just meddling. You're getting in the business uh, of police officers, and they're pressured not to to get too involved uh you have internal you have internal problems like because some people will bring civil suits when they get beat up by a police officer and they you know sometimes they settle sometimes they win sometimes they lose it's really hard to it's really hard to win one of these civil suits but even when they do there's no mechanism that makes that civil suit or the facts from that suit get into the record of that police officer. Uh, there was a case I did for policemisconduct.net the other day where the, uh, the, the officer was, uh, he was convicted of obstruction of justice, and the two charges he, he beat uh, were he, he, he threw a, a driver in the back of his vehicle for not signaling to turn. He, he took the guy into custody and started driving him around. And then he found out he's an Iraq war vet. And he was like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, no big deal. Sorry about that. You know, <laughs> false imprisonment and whatnot. And uh, he beat the first two charges, but he, he got convicted on the obstruction charge, which is still a felony. Uh, he was facing two years in jail. The prosecutor asked for two years, 23 months. And the judge was like, you know, he lost his job. He's got a felony record. We're going to give him one day. One day and six months house arrest. And... The, he's, he had an impeccable record, they always say, the, the, whether it's the judge or the prosecutor. He had an impeccable record. He was a good civil servant. He made a mistake, and we, we should let him go on this. Well, the thing is, is he had several civil suits of police brutality against him, and he lost some of them. But that never made it into his record, so that's just not something that police departments look for. That's not something they want to include because, obviously, if you have some, if it's in their actual file – then you know that's going to be uh, evidence if when this uh, officer comes to testify. I want to get to possible paths to reform, but before that, I I was curious about public perceptions of bad cops. Like, has the in general the the public's notion of what counts as a good cop or a bad cop or what kind of behavior is appropriate for policing changed? Because I'm struck by so. For a long time, shows about police officers have been popular on television. And if you if you look at those over time, it's the way that cops behave on TV. From Dragnet to the Shield. Yeah, like on Dragnet, they're these very straight-laced. And and then you get to like Hill Street Blues is a similar way. And even like early Law and Order, they're all kind of good, upstanding cops. But now we have things that look more like 
the shield where every cop is corrupt and they're busting heads if that means getting the guy and the constitution is kind of this thing that we have to figure out how to get around because otherwise it's going to let the bad guys escape and that seems to be the more prominent view of police work as like the rebel who you know may have to turn in his badge but then he gets it back um do so I guess have, has the public perception shifted in a similar way and do cops – I mean also do cops learn how to be cops from this pop culture view? Um, what, I've, what I've looked at is like the Pew uh, – no, not Pew. Gallup does the, the faith in uh, public institutions and the police, you know, they're pretty solid around 60 percent support uh, pretty much across the board. I think normally – with the pop culture thing, I, I haven't looked at any like demographic data on this or anything, but it, it seems to me that people sort of excuse that behavior because, you know, they had it coming. You know, it's always like got off on a technicality. That's this, you know, oh, he got away because of a technicality. Yeah, that technicality is called the Constitution more often than not. But people think, well, criminals are bad people. Bad things happen to bad people. Eh, who cares? And I think that's one of these things that people are really uh, – that, that they kind of glom on to. I mean you look at what happened with, with Michael Brown. Here is a guy who is a shoplifter. Technically, he's a criminal. And there's no evidence of what happened. Now, keep in mind, Darren Brown's story is completely unbelievable. But you know, people are like, oh, he's a thug. I support Darren Wilson, blah, blah, blah. Those same people who were absolutely sure that – Mike Brown, after being shot, charged a, f- a, f- uh, a police officer with a gun pointed at him. Look at the Eric Garner tape in Staten Island. They're like, oh, my God, I can't believe that happened. I, I cannot believe that that was something that they did. Chokeholds have been banned forever. I mean, you still have people saying, well, you know, he was, he was overweight, and so if he wasn't overweight, then, you know, he would have survived. Or he was resisting arrest. I don't know how this – how holding up your hands is resisting arrest, but okay. But it's just sort of people have to see it to believe it when they realize that police go over the line. They, I think they give them the benefit of the doubt when police use violence. But I, I, I don't think that generally think, speaking that they're like, oh, well, and even when they do, it's like, oh, it's a bad cop. You know, it's just like it's like the bad apple, which is, again, why I hate the term. So given these layers of corrupting culture and influence that have gotten us to the situation we're in now – how do we fix it? Is it possible to fix this? It's going to take a lot of time and it's going to take governments being very, you know, very hard on their police officers. I, I think uh, body cameras are a neutral arbiter when there's a conflict in sto- when there's a conflicting story. Um, this, of course, is not a cure all because often what will happen when uh, when there's a dispute about an altercation, there's a. TV reporter who got a uh, female t- TV reporter who was roughed up by police officers maybe 10 years ago. And uh, all the all the police officers that responded had their dash cams on, right? They, they, there's seven police officers that come to the scene. She says she was roughed up. She They go to trial. All the footage is gone. Amazing. It's like the Watergate tapes. Yeah, it's, just, it's amazing. It's gone. And because police officers have this sort of benefit of the doubt, she lost. But uh, people have suggested, like Scott Greenfield of Simple Justice, that when there is an altercation and then there is a uh, there's accusation of police misconduct and there was a camera there and the footage is gone, the assumption should go to the plaintiff. Now, what about accountability standards? Would, would you, I've always thought it's very bizarre that police can shoot someone on the slightest fear. Like 0.1% chance that they have a gun – dead, right? Would you be in favor of raising that to have more reasonable, a higher standard of fear or threat? Well, the, the problem is, is it's supposed to be an objectively reasonable standard now. But in practice, that it, it boils down to does the jury trust the police officer? So I don't know what standards are really going to help. Uh, it, it, just adjusting them, if you change the language a little bit, maybe... It, it, again, without the, without the video evidence, I don't know what um, what more we can do from an administrative position. Uh, one of the things I think we can do, as, as you mentioned with the unions, is break this ability to protect bad cops. It's 
uh, I was at an event a few months ago with uh, D.C. Police Chief Kathy Lanier, and she said, we have to be really careful with our training program because after nine months, their probationary period over is over, and it's almost impossible to fire them. So police chiefs who know that they have problem officers, and everyone knows they have problem officers, can't even fire, cannot fire bad cops when everyone knows that they're bad. There have been, there are times where officers are caught, suspended, fired, tried, and they, they, they could take a plea deal and they can still keep their law enforcement li- law officer's license. They'll apply back for their old job and the police chief says, no, I don't want, them, don't want them back. They're a pain. And uh, there's this arbitrator, again, helped by the – that was put into the city contract by the unions. And they say, oh, nope, you got to give them their job back. So being able to get, like strip the arbitrator and give police chiefs the power to fire bad officers would be a great step. So we've got some time for questions. So if you've got a question, come up to the mic, and given that we don't have a lot of time, keep it a question, please. Question. Are alleged instances of sexual assault recorded by the FBI or asked for? Um, uh, like, from police officers? Um, not to my knowledge, because so much of this is, they, 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 keep stat, they keep track of instances per, like, per unit, I mean, it, like the national at the national level, how many sexual assaults are reported and all that, but there is no separate category for uh, like sexual crimes by police no you've discussed the danger of policing with a military mindset, however, actual soldiers undergo extensive training are held to strict rules of engagement and prosecuted for misconduct under the UCMJ. Given that our police often behave like trigger happy militias. Might we see less violence in policing if we were to replace our warrior cops with actual soldiers? I have nothing against the, the someone with military background coming in, coming into the police department. I, I have no bias against the military. My fear is hiring people because they can and being incentivized to hire people out of the military, whether or not um, because a lot of a lot of police departments are are having a hard time finding finding good recruits. And so the standards that they that they set are are not very high. I, I again I have no problem with hiring former former soldiers, but insofar as the way that police hiring actually happens, that it's it, it's becoming difficult to keep track of, you know, to keep the standards high on like stability just across the board, soldiers and non soldiers alike. I think if police started attacking well-suited white men the way they do blacks or other people who don't look very well off, I think public perceptions would change quite rapidly. I think there's an implicit bias in people's perceptions. So they see someone who's not well-dressed or who's black, who's poor, and they think, oh, he must have done something. But if they started seeing people who look like executives being brutalized, then they wouldn't think that, right? But of course... The police are not going to brutalize well-off people because they, they might not get off with their crime. Oh, that, that's absolutely true. Um, I, I didn't really get to touch on it here, but I mean, racial bias and class bias in the police is unquestionable. It, you look at police own reports when they when they get hit with uh, corruption investigations, whether it's the LA uh, Commission after the Rodney King beating or um, uh, the Mullen Commission. Various other police recognize it. Just this week, the FBI director says, admitted to the implicit bias in policing. Um, everyone knows that white people do drugs at the same level as, as black people and others. Um, and we know that certain professions, you know, sort of go towards certain kind of drugs, but you don't see investment bankers lined up outside of Goldman Sachs, you know, with their pockets turned out because they, they can afford the lawyers that can win. And, and, and until we get this sort of an accountable police force that is in, accountable internally, accountable to the federal government, and accountable to the civilian review boards that are that should be set up. That this will continue, and that's unfortunate. So obviously, body cameras are well intentioned from a libertarian perspective, but by giving law enforcement officers more cameras, couldn't that possibly infringe upon citizens' privacy rights? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you should. Def- it's 
when you have uh, any time where you're going to allow a police officer in your home with a camera, that's going to be a problem because what they can do if they're in to like investigate a robbery and then they like go back and look at the the evidence. Well, robbery is a bad, a bad example because they should be looking for clues in that in that case. But if they're coming over for a domestic for a domestic disturbance, right, you're yelling at, you know, your brother and someone called the cops, they come over. And, you know, they go back and they look at that evidence and they see, you know, a water pipe or, or something sitting out. They're like, oh, we can go back in uh, with that evidence and, you know, send a SWAT team and then people die. That's really bad. So it's not that it should just be like body cameras and let it go and be on with it. You need to set up rules to prevent um, – to have – uh, the clearing of evidence when it's no longer when it's lo- no longer useful, not using the evidence for anything that it was like not intended to, not intended for. Obviously, if you let a police officer in your house and they see a, you know a water pipe, well, you know that's that's too bad. But um, but as far as like the 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 video evidence, there need to be rules uh, implemented uh, also for like confidential informants and that sort of thing. Well, if you've ever seen an episode of Cops, you'll see the kind of stuff that people might not want to be aired uh, into the public. Yes, indeed. Um, I have kind of a similar question um, as far as infringing on our liberties. I know personally I've been pulled over a few times and I've had cops let me off because I batted my eyelashes or cried or whatever. How would wearing body cameras possibly affect the good cops from being able to help people? I mean the ones people? who don't give you a ticket. Exactly. <laughs> That's why I said good cops. Uh, but the ones who are more understanding in situations, do you think that that could possibly – kind of cause more issues if they have to actually follow through yeah but i would think you know i don't think anyone goes through and you know is going to review every single body camera of every single police officer for every single thing that they do they're going to look at it when there is a conflict when there is a crime involved when there's something like that with as as far as the cameras there you know police policemen have the discretion it's, it's completely legal to let you go after speeding so it's not that they're committing misconduct by letting you go. So I don't think that particularly would be a problem. Um, but it, that will b- become a problem when they start looking, like if they look the other way on drug deals or something along those lines. But, but as far as, you know, just day-to-day interaction, I, don't, I think it's, it's better because they know if you complain, like if, if they rough you up, if they sexually harass you and you complain, they go back to that tape, that's going to that's gonna be on them. How do you think the um, Department of Justice surplus programs have sort of raised the stakes in the police brutality argument, you know, by by further militarizing smaller police departments who either don't need the kind of weaponry they're being provided or who don't have the proper training to use that type of weaponry? How has this kind of changed the landscape of of the police brutality debate? Uh, Yeah, that's uh, it's one of my areas. Uh, It's. The the problem with the police militarization is that what no one thought, I think, when they started giving – it's the same thing happened with civil asset forfeiture. Like no one seemed to think it would change the incentives. It, it, with civil asset forfeiture, if people don't know that, that's when they take your stuff without convicting you of a crime. And originally they were like, well, this could be great. Drug dealers are going to be funding the cops. Won't that be ironic and wonderful? But they didn't realize that they would start funding themselves. Similarly with the militarization, they're like, well, they'll be safer. You know, give them an armored car and a – in a grenade launcher because you know that that's really useful in domestic law enforcement and they didn't really realize that they'd say if we have we might as well use it and and there's a marginal safety benefit to riding up in an armored vehicle and usually they think what is the number one rule of policing anyone know this like bad the number one rule of policing is get home for dinner it comes from untouchables but that's the wrong attitude like it, it's also i mean you want cops to be protected but not at the expense of well, let's drive a tank into their into their house because we want to get home for dinner, right? And and, and I think also it's attracted different types of cops. In Radley Balco's book, um, one of the which is Rise of the Warrior Cop, which is spectacular, one of the best public policy books ever written, I think. He talks about how when a bunch of cops came out for the Denver D- Democratic Convention in Denver because uh, they kind of did all hands on deck for that, that they had shirts for this one department that were made up that said, you know, DNCC uh, 2008, we get up early to beat the crowds. And there's just like a cop like punching like a bunch of people. And I think that's the militarization thing goes into that. You look at these recruitment videos and all this stuff is like, be a cop, kick some ass. So it's not officer friendly anymore. It's officer 
shut the fuck up and listen to me. Right. So, um, I didn't know we could swear on this, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it's free thoughts, man. Free yourself. All right. Um, I, adding to that, I mean, you, you see what's going on right now in New York. Uh, so, Bill Bratton, Commissioner Bill, New York Police Commissioner Bill Bratton says he's going to start this new unit. It's going to have three hundred guys to handle uh, terrorism like Madrid and and uh, and Paris and crowd control as in he he made the direct comparison uh with the black lives matter uh, protests they're going to have more armor they're going to have long guns and machine guns now i seem to think that terrorism and murdering people is slightly different than my first amendment rights and this sort of this has become so blurred partially because of the militarization and going back to what what he said earlier that the the training with the with the military is really actually essential because they asked i know when the ferguson protests were going down and they had you know weapons trained on protesters that military people came out and were like what are they doing that's not something that we would do so but yeah i, I think the, the militarization the whole thrust of it has just uh amplified that us versus them mentality that already was there Um, Given the bureaucratic nature of law enforcement, it seems doubtful that uh, real change could come quickly um, and that an incentive system could be created that would hold cops accountable. Should we consider possibly privatizing police forces? Do you think this would be beneficial or even possible, or should the government solely run it? That's a profound question. Uh, It's... There's only been one – I don't think it's been adequately studied. It is important to point out that you can measure the ineffectiveness of police by almost measuring spending on private security, right? If you want to to say this is where police are failing, how much people spend on locks, security systems, private security guards because the police aren't there. Now, we, of course, don't want them there all the time standing on every street corner and things like that. So we do spend a lot privately on security. Um, now, whether or not we want to roll back or like transfer things over, the only book that's ever really been written about this that I know of is Bruce Benson's uh, police uh, – I can't remember what the name of it is. But it's Bruce Benson's To Serve and Protect, um, and, and there hasn't been a lot done on it. Uh, it's, it's not – I would prefer many private security things over, over many police situations, especially uh, in, situ- in areas um, where the police are – more of a problem than a solution like the inner city, right? They're like an occupying force. Um, and there is private security there. I mean, gun ownership and things like that is also private security. So I would be, I would be in favor of ramping that up. Um, but it, there's a lot of open questions still. Yeah. And this, I mean, this gets to core points of libertarian political theory too, right? Because unless you're on the anarchist wing of libertarianism, you probably think that among those things that even Robert Nozick would endorse as a proper role of the state is protection of our rights via police and courts. Um, so, so we'd need to. I mean, you, you could. We would need to answer those sorts of questions as well. Like, is this is this a role of the government? Is this a role that the private sector should fulfill? Are there benefits to having monopoly law enforcement? Because there's concerns of what would competition do? Would you know what happens if? Private is great, but there are people who might not be able to afford it. And do we want only people who have money to be able to have protection of their rights, which would, of course, create a spiraling effect because if you don't have your rights being protected, it's going to be awfully hard to dig yourself out of poverty at all. Um, so it's – I mean there's a lot of big questions contained in that question. Yeah, I mean my, my, my one of my fears about private – private policing is it would i think amplify the problems that we have now there's a book called um the collapse of the american criminal justice by uh, william stunts and it taught one of his major points was that so much of what we had with the ramping up of militarization the ramping up of the drug war was white american suburbia paying for and asking for and politically pushing for the drug war in the inner city and that so again, you have the people with the money dictating the laws and not feeling the effects of it that the other people do. And so again, I think that would just kind of exacerbate the problem with, with in the inner city. 
I think we have time for one more, actually, yeah. So uh, with television shows such as Cops and like Bait Car, which is like I think blatant and World, entrapment, what, world's wildest police chases, the yeah. most pro cop thing ever. Exactly. Yes. Um, uh, does that one? How is Bait Car legal? Because I think that's entrapment from what I've seen. Um, and then two, does that not establish somewhat of a culture that allows for us to like like you just said pro cop that we like like hero heroize these people that uh, are doing things that I would call illegal? I think I think it does. I, I'm. Michael Malice wrote a piece a while back about why he's never been a been a fan of the police because he was born in the Soviet Union and the police was the the last thing you wanted to come. There was no there, it was you know a civil service job and there, and there was no her, heroic element of it. And I think what Aaron said about some of the shows, World's Wildest Police Chases, just drives me nuts. It's always like he thinks he could run, but he couldn't run fast behind bars and that kind of like. So I think I mean I do think it's a problem. Um, but I also, I mean, I don't think we should hate police like on site. I think we should, but we should regard them for what they are and try to avoid using them and think that they're a necessary evil at best, right? Not like heroes of, of public servants. I, I don't even like the public servant word. If they were not getting paid, they'd be public servants, right? But they're getting paid to do a job. So we need to make sure they're doing it well. Um, I, I come from a position where my father was a police officer. And so, you know, I grew up on a policeman's, you know, as a beneficiary of a policeman's pension and and that sort of thing. So I'm I'm certainly not anti-cop. But keep in mind, my father, he he ran for sheriff in my hometown. And he, we would go out and he'd been retired from from the force. And people would always come up to say, hey, hey, Mr. Blanks, you know, Officer Blanks, all this, all like, as long as I can remember until the day he died we would be out and someone would recognize him and come out and say hello. He was a beat cop. People in the neighborhood knew him and he treated people well. And this is not the sort of policing that we have now. If we can get to an actual community style policing that the the federal government is pushing, um, I would, I would appreciate it. I I, I welcome it because right now the community order oriented policing has incentivized cops to run around, jump out of cars and throw people up against the wall. Best cop show ever is The Shield, by the way. If anyone doesn't know that, you should watch The Shield. Yes. Um, my question actually kind of uh, is a follow-up question to that about um, the police force present in the community and how they are um, less present in community life than they than they used to be. Um, so this might provide a, a feeling of detachment from the public, which could lead to a sense of superiority. So does the police force need to be more present in everyday community life in order to respect the community and better help protect and serve yeah absolutely as i said my father was well respected people really liked him people came up to him i don't think too many police officers get that right now because you don't know i don't know i mean there's a policeman who lives in my apartment building i don't know his name i don't know you know i he yeah it's always it's always parked out sorry my fiance's in front um he always parked outside and i'm sure he's a nice guy but you know we don't know him and i think part of this is also i think america has changed a lot you know people always used to know their neighbors and all that and it doesn't really happen so much anymore but in the areas when they're going to be you know protecting businesses and you're go- going to know the s- store owners coming to city hall meetings and all that that's where police officers should be and they should be instead of approaching someone as hostile and as you know a suspect treat them like a human being and i think a lot of that has changed and i think part of it is the detachment that you talked about thank you for listening to free thoughts if you have any questions or comments about today's show you can find us on twitter at free thoughts pod that's free thoughts p-o-d free thoughts is a project of libertarianism.org and the cato institute and is produced by evan banks To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.